Was there a chemistry test? How did you get to know each other? <laughs> oh, I met her in the street. She was mine for the price of a drink. <laughs> wow. As this last one concerns age and frailty and, and changing nature of life, it was uh, especially compelling to me because I am of that age. When do you think Phoebe has made you laugh the most on set? <sighs> okay, one, one last thing. There are three indispensable people without whom none of us would be here tonight, and that starts with George Lucas. The person who is Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford. And the person who is the glue to all five of these films that gave us all of our rhythm and all of our melody, the great maestro, John Williams. Gotcha. Nerderotic.com. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dementia is the first film to be released by Lucasfilm in the theaters since the rise of Palpatine. That was 1,290 days ago. And now that I've seen it, I'm only left with one question, which just so happens to be the same question I asked when this was announced. Why? 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 Time is valuable, and so is money. But you can only get one of the two previously mentioned back. But I'd like to save you both. I've wasted two and a half hours of my life, so you don't have to waste two and a half hours of yours. If you love Indiana Jones films, don't see Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I went to the dentist this morning, and it was more enjoyable than this film. Our expectations were not subverted. Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm once again desecrated a beloved character, one that they just haven't gotten around to yet. And yes... Indiana Jones was sacrificed on the altar of agenda to bolster another brunette British woman. And once again, Harrison Ford is involved, but at least Han Solo was put out of his misery. This one wanted Indy to suffer as much as the audience. But let's not bury the lead here. The reason this movie was insufferable was thanks to feminist Hollywood darling and enemy of franchises, Phoebe Waller-Bridge. And it turns out every post can Film Festival Reddit leak was absolutely true. Indiana Jones begins and ends this film as sad and broken as Hollywood is. And the queen of franchise destruction, Kathleen Kennedy, who is also the worst studio head in Hollywood of all time, has destroyed every last vestige of George Lucas's legacy, with the added bonus this time of being able to stick it to her old boss, Steven Spielberg. I remember Kathy came into the room with her steno pad and her pencil, and she was horrible at taking notes, and she was terrible, and she didn't really know how to do it very well. But what she did know how to do was interrupt somebody in mid-sentence. We'd be pitching ideas back and forth, and Kathy, who's supposed to be writing these ideas down, suddenly put her pencil down and would say something like, and what if he didn't get the girl, but instead he got the dog? So join me, you over 780,000 Awakening Wonders and the 40% who haven't subscribed yet. Let's go over, quite frankly, the last thing Lucasfilm has to ruin. Indiana Jones and the Disaster of Destiny. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are gone, but Kathleen Kennedy, John Williams, an 80-year-old Harrison Ford, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and James Mangold are here to create what might be the worst crime against imagination, a boring Indiana Jones film, which is far worse than The Crystal Skull, that may flop, with the added bonus of getting very close to becoming an on-brand Disney Lucasfilm bait-and-switch. Scratch that, it is an on-brand Disney Lucasfilm bait-and-switch. The entire story runs through Phoebe Waller-Bridge's insanely annoying Helena Shaw. And unlike the erroneous theory out there that if you remove Indiana Jones from Raiders of the Lost Ark, the outcome of the film will remain the same, after watching Indiana Jones and the Diarrhea of Destiny, this film is quite literally pointless in more ways than one, and we'll get to that. But before I get into breaking down another one of our heroes being broken down, I think I'd be remiss not to point out that a group of people thought it was a good idea to give Kathleen Kennedy, the woman who destroyed Star Wars, $300 million to destroy Indiana Jones. Yeah, take a long, slow look at these window-licking morons, including Chief Moron, who has returned to lord over the disasters that he created 
Bobby Iger. And no, not even director James Mangold, who's made some very good films in the past, could save this from being another Disney Lucasfilm abomination. And while I would call the first 20 minutes of this film tolerable, mainly because they don't have Phoebe Waller-Bridge, it does have a de-aged Mads Mikkelsen, who they managed to make look worse than the de-aged Harrison Ford, who ended up looking like a 40-year-old who talks and walks like an 80-year-old. This 20-minute scene goes on and on as a really bad Spielberg impression, and it suffers from the same problem Crystal Skull did, an over-reliance on CGI. Mix in some over-excessive shaking of the camera and scenes too dark to see, and you have a modern Disney film. This flashback scene takes place towards the end of World War II, where the Nazis are fleeing with artifacts that turn out to be fake, including a fake Spear of Destiny, but this really long scene ended up being unintentionally meta because we're watching a fake Indiana Jones film. Indy ends up saving his friend Basil Shaw, played by Toby Jones, which is his first mistake considering what it leads to. They also managed to find half of a genuine artifact, the Dial of Destiny, or the Antikythera, which is based on the Antikythera mechanism. We've had to rethink the history of technology completely as a result of this single object. It's such a clever, extraordinary, sophisticated machine. Completely, completely shocking for ancient Greece. It was discovered that there were gear wheels inside it. This was the first shock because Anything from ancient Greece simply shouldn't have gear wheels. These were precision gears with teeth about a millimeter long. And this was just completely, completely shocking. Go look it up for yourself. That story is far more interesting than this movie. Again, that was one of the more tolerable scenes. I would have much rather have seen that but now it's over and things go downhill, but not to worry. There's only two hours and 10 minutes of this film to go. Fast forward to 1969, the year I was born, and Indiana Jones is sad, pathetic, possibly alcoholic, his son is dead, and he's been served divorce papers. Sounds fun, right? Grab the kids, jump into the car, and let's go see a sad, broken down version of your dad's favorite character get demoralized some more. And they don't waste any time if any of that wasn't enough, Indiana Jones is on the verge of retirement, and the kids who used to adore him are now bored by him. As I said, this is where a film that wasn't very good in the first place goes completely downhill because we are introduced to Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Helena Shaw, the character they killed off Indiana Jones's son, Mutt Lang, for so he can be given a female version of himself, except absolutely insufferable. And I know a lot of the critics at Cannes were saying she was the one who brought down this movie, and they were not underselling that. When I say insufferable, I want you to think of a thousand fingers scratching on a thousand chalkboards mixed in with the cackling of a thousand hens. But a film that takes place in 1969 is not going to stop Disney Lucasfilm from inserting a diverse girl boss who just so happens to be in charge of the CIA Nazi team. And it appears Mads Mikkelsen's Jürgen Voller survives getting smashed in the face on a high-speed train after the Antikythera was stolen from him back in 1939, and now he's playing the part of Werner von Braun. Perhaps the most notable recruit brought to America under Operation Paperclip was Werner von Braun, who had been the technical director at the Peenemünde Army Research Center in Germany, where the V-2 rocket was developed, which would rain death and destruction on Great Britain during the early years of the war. Go look it up for yourself. That story is far more interesting than this movie. The CIA Nazis with the very diverse girl boss are in pursuit of not Indiana Jones, but Helena Shaw, who knows that Indiana Jones has the Antikythera. He doesn't recognize her at first after not seeing her for 18 years, but then he decides to take her to it, which leads the CIA slash Nazi team led by the diverse girl boss to go to the school and murder staff. The insufferable feminist then double crosses Voller's CIA Nazi team led by the diverse girl boss and Indiana Jones, who Helena leaves to die, and then the murders get pinned on Indy. And the creators of this film want you to actually like the character of Helena Shaw. Can't imagine why people don't. I guess the good news is not that many people are actually Actually gonna see this film. They got that going for him. Then we get the second bloated, over CGI'd, inane chase scene. I don't know if I've mentioned that this movie is long, but the good news is, I guess, if you decide to see it, which you shouldn't, you'll have lots of opportunities to take bathroom breaks, check your phone, have a nap ponder your very bad decision. The action scenes reflect the entirety of Indiana Jones and the dialysis of destruction. 
empty and soulless. After the now wanted for murder, Indiana Jones rides a horsey into a subway, he escapes and meets Sala, which is supposed to be one of the scenes that makes us feel happy. You remember Sala, and it just makes you feel sad. And that, again, is Crimes Against Imagination, a sad and dour Indiana Jones movie. Then we get some exposition. Helena Shaw, who of course is a better archaeologist than Indiana Jones, is selling artifacts on the black market, and Indiana Jones is wanted for murder. And during this manhunt for Indiana Jones, Sala decides to drop Indy off in the front of the airport and then yell his name. Get him! Indiana Jones. Shut up! Now! Now, I know airport security was a lot more lax in 1969, but I'm guessing they would have put a cop or two at the airport, but not in this movie. Then there's another flashback where they attempt to provide some characterization for Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Helena Shaw. We see Basil Shaw attempting to destroy the Antikythera because he has discovered that it can predict fissures in time. How? The power of math, people. Now, Basil has been driven mad by the device, and he wants to destroy it, but Indy keeps him from destroying it, and then takes it, and then promises to destroy it. No, that doesn't make very much sense, but there's a lot of that in this movie. All this happens in front of 12-year-old Helena Shaw, and then the good friend of Basil Shaw, so much so that he made Indiana Jones the godfather of his daughter, fucked off, never to see him again, and then he doesn't do the thing he promised to do. Destroy the Antikythera. Now, if it wasn't enough to make Indy sad, broken, pathetic, possibly alcoholic, retiring, serve divorce papers, and also giving him a dead son, they also made him a dick. But there is another unintentional meta line within that flashback scene when Basil Shaw says, some things should stay buried. Yes, they should. And despite there being a manhunt for Indiana Jones because he is suspected of murder, he's able to easily board a plane and go to Morocco. Then we are introduced to a slightly less annoying character than Helena Shaw. Marcus, or shorter -er, rounder. -er. Indiana Jones arrives just as Helena Shaw is selling the half of the Antikythera to the highest bidder, and this brings us to this scene. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. You gotta love it when a multi-billion dollar corporation that spent $300 million on this movie alone, who was so far in bed with the CCP they thanked a concentration camp in China, wants to make some sort of commentary on capitalism. This is followed by another boring chase scene that is filled with contrivances within a movie that's filled with contrivances. This is involving Voller with his Nazi goons who are still affiliated with the CIA at this point, shorter -er, rounder -er, Indiana Jones, and our lead, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Helena Shaw. This is where we need to talk about suspension of disbelief, and I know this gets stretched a bit in Indiana Jones films, but I can handle a bunch of angels flying out of a gold box and killing some Nazis. I can handle a guy getting his heart ripped out and he's still alive to see it. I can handle a 900-year-old knight passing out some drinks. I can handle a bunch of people jumping out of a plane in a raft and surviving. I would even go so far to say that I can handle Indiana Jones surviving a nuclear explosion in a refrigerator. But there's no way in hell you're going to convince me that Phoebe Waller-Bridge is beautiful. How did you end up like this? Oh, but it doesn't end there. Then we get Phoebe Waller-Bridge action star. She's resourceful, <laughs> beautiful. She can memorize her father's books. She's a better archaeologist than Indiana Jones. This is what it sounds like. Self-insert Kathleen Kennedy fanfic. After another monotonous chase, Voller and his Nazi goons are somehow caught by the CIA. How? Don't know. The CIA picked up Voller just to tell him he's been cut off. Then he betrays them. Then he kills the diverse girl boss of the CIA Nazi team and reveals he's a Nazi. How did she not know that? Don't know. Helena and her sidekicks, Shorter, Rounderer, and Indiana Jones figure out that the other half of the Antikythera is where they found the original half in a Roman ship that broke in half, and our hero and her sidekicks go off to find it. With the help of Antonio Banderas, on Antonio Banderas' boat, we get a stellar scene where we find out that Indiana Jones, if he could go back in time, would try to keep his son, Mutt Lang, from enlisting because he enlisted into the Vietnam War to piss Indiana Jones off, and that's where he died. So Mutt Lang died, pissed at his father, this movie. Then we get this banger of a line. I don't believe in magic wombat, but a few times in my life I've seen things, things I can't explain, and I've come to believe it's not so much what you believe, it's how hard you believe it. What? 
Bro, what are you talking about, man? What exactly is that supposed to mean? Indiana Jones, believe hard. Anyway, Antonio Banderas, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and Indiana Jones dive down and find a MacGuffin that will lead them to the other half of the Antikythera. They also see some eels because, remember, snakes. The Nazis catch them, and Antonio Banderas, who shows up just long enough to go for a swim, deliver some poorly executed lines, goes ahead and dies. Right behind you. R.I.P. Antonio Banderas, you were the bomb in Zorro. So after the insufferable feminist damn near gets everyone killed, she's able to escape with her sidekicks, shorter, rounder, and Indiana Jones in the diapers of despair. The insufferable feminist is awfully proud of herself, and then Indiana Jones has to remind her that his friend has just been killed. She says she's sorry, but she gets over it real quick. Shorter-er, rounder-er ends up getting caught by the Nazi goons, and then everyone's on their way to Archimedes' tomb to get the other half of the Antikythera. And because they're really into driving points home in this film, there is a scene where Indy's climbing a wall, and he has to remind us that he's really old. Yeah, we got that. And since when is Indiana Jones scared of bugs and arachnids? <laughs> Indiana Jake and the insufferable feminist make it to Archimedes' tomb where they find the other half of the Dial of Destiny, inscriptions on the side that look like birds with propellers, and Archimedes is wearing a watch, proving that the Antikythera can be used to travel in time, but there's a twist. Shorter, rounder ends up killing the biggest goon and then escapes. Then there's another scuffle as Voller catches up to Indy and Big Bird. Indy gets shot and captured, and Shorter or Rounder saves the emu. Then we find out Voller's big plan. He's going to go back in time with five or six other guys and reboot the Fourth Reich by killing Hitler in 1936. Indiana Jones is old, miserable, shot, and captured by Nazis. How is he going to survive? Not to worry. Phoebe Waller-Bridge action star is in hot pursuit. Yeah, she's about as much of an action star as she is beautiful. She steals a motorcycle. She sends Shorter Rounder off to go fly a plane based on the knowledge of one lesson from a drunk pilot in a brothel. They fly now? They fly now! Then the gangly British woman action star chases down the German plane on a motorcycle, jumps off said motorcycle onto the moving plane's landing gear. And that is only slightly more believable than Phoebe Waller-Bridge being beautiful, which is slightly less believable than Shorter or Rounder getting into a plane, being able to fly it, and then following a German plane through a time fissure. And yes, the Antikythera can travel in time, but that twist is it can only go to one place, the Siege of Syracuse. So both planes make it through the time fissure, and after the initial astonishment, the German plane is damaged by a Roman bolt, and instead of doing something like, I don't know, flying up, it decides to stay at an altitude where it can get damaged by more Roman bolts and trebuchet projectiles. I guess the Nazis kind of forgot about the Roman fleet. Indiana Jones is shot and fighting Nazis. Helena Shaw is trying to save Indiana Jones from the Nazis. The Nazis are too busy not flying up to avoid the Romans. In the interest of your valuable time and mine, we're just going to get this over with. The German plane is too badly damaged and can no longer gain altitude because they never bothered to gain altitude when they could. The insufferable feminist and Indy escape with a parachute Shoot. Baller and the German goons die in the plane crash, and Indy and the Stork end up meeting Archimedes as they were destined to. But Disney and Lucasfilm are not done deconstructing our favorite hero. Indiana Jones, one of the greatest characters ever created who fought his entire fictional life to preserve history, now just wants to give up and die in the past, which he could unintentionally or intentionally change, which would put the future in danger, and it's a total betrayal of this character. And this leads us to the worst scene easily in any Indiana Jones film and maybe the worst scene Lucasfilm has ever created. And yes, in the Indiana Jones film, Phoebe Waller-Bridge is here to save the day. After Indy basically pleads to just lay down and die, she knocks him out and they're back in New York. And yeah, it's that quick. All to bring us to a very contrived ending and the return of Karen Allen's Marion, where they reverse and repurpose a scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And this is supposed to be the happy ending. Of course, you'll have to forget that it completely destroys the one good thing about Crystal Skull, the ending where Indy and Marion get married in front of their son. And it tries to be another indie finale when we already had a perfect indie finale. 
Indiana Jones riding off into the sunset with his dad, Sala, and Brody. But it can undo it because there's only three Indiana Jones films, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, and Last Crusade. In the simplest terms, this was a really bad movie. It was poorly shot, poorly edited, and poorly written. And considering how many times this film was delayed, there's no excuse for that. Yet, I am left with a lot of questions about this very confusing film. How did the CIA knowingly protect a former Nazi and actively help him in his side hustle of trying to restart the Fourth Reich and not notice he was a Nazi? I'm guessing Diversity Girl Boss wasn't their strength. Who in the hell was this CIA guy with crutches who got murdered by Indiana Jones? After the faculty was killed at the university, how in the hell was following Helena Shaw and getting back the Dial of Destiny going to clear Indiana Jones' name of murder. How in the hell did Sala know that Helena has sold black market artifacts in the past? Who was bailed her out when she was busted? What time the auction was going to be in Morocco? What time Helena was going to be in Morocco? What, did he Google it? How in the hell did shorter -er, rounder -er learn how to fly from one lesson by a drunk pilot on fake instruments in a brothel? How did the insufferable feminist Indiana Jones shorter rounder, oh, and a pilot who randomly fell asleep and woke up while they were flying through the fissure that I forgot to mention, all fit in a very small plane and then take off with no runway and then fly back through a fissure to 1969? And once they did that, how did the wanted murderer Indiana Jones just fly back to New York? And what happened to those murder charges because they never mentioned if he cleared his name or not? All those questions are met with the collective, I don't know, and honestly, I don't care because because this movie, again, is quite literally pointless. Apparently, Archimedes invented the Antica Theorem to open up a time fissure to possibly get some help against the Romans, which doesn't work. Syracuse still falls, Archimedes still dies, the Dial of Destiny was only set to go to one place, so the Nazis were never going to achieve their goal of killing Hitler in 1936 and rebooting the Fourth Reich. That being said, this film would still have an awkward plot synopsis if you think about it. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Daredevil archaeologist Indiana Jones races against time with an insufferable feminist to save Hitler. And as far as that erroneous theory goes about removing Indiana Jones from Raiders of the Lost Ark and the outcome remains the same, I would counter it with removing Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Helena Shaw from the Dial of Dysentery. Remove her from the story and it's a lot shorter, less miserable, a few more people would still be alive, and the outcome remains the same. And Indy probably would have gotten back together with Marion anyway. And I guess the good news is there are no more characters Kathleen Kennedy and Disney Lucasfilm can f*** up from George Lucas with the added bonus of this film probably ending the inexplicable 15 minutes of fame of Phoebe Waller-Bridge. And this may come as a shocker, but Indiana Jones and the replacement hip is going to flop, falling well below the very low, optimistic opening weekend of $70 million. It now looks like it's going to have a $60 million opening weekend, which is $40 million below the Crystal Skulls opening weekend, which came out 15 years ago, which is an opening weekend comparable to the massive flop that was The Flash. And I remind you, this is a $300 million film. It needs to make $750 million worldwide minimum to turn a profit. Yet somehow, Kathleen Kennedy still has a job. Like I said, this film is dour. It is miserable. It is an Indiana Jones film brought to you by the studio that made The Last Jedi for people who like The Last Jedi. But wait, I've got some breaking news. This just in from a very reliable source. I am told that Kathleen Kennedy is out at Lucasfilm as soon as she leaves. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Nerdorotic.com Thank you.